Good morning. I'm Jay Lynn Johnson, and I'd like to welcome you to the Copyright Office's World IP Day celebration and our latest installment in the Copyright Matters Lecture Series. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that closed captioning for this event is available by visiting the link to streamtext.net that was provided in the email reminder for the event and also appears at the bottom of the screen. Today, we're joining the World Intellectual Property Organization in countries all over the world to celebrate and highlight intellectual property's impact on a green future. You may be aware that patents protect many of the inventions that help create energy efficient technologies and lessen our carbon footprint. And you may have seen trademarks that help consumers identify eco-friendly and sustainable products and services. But today, we'll observe how through the copyright system, creators and creative works play a key role in crafting a vision of a more green future. For example, some of our favorite and most notable musicians sang songs about environmental issues, including the Beach Boys in Don't Go Near the Water, Joni Mitchell in Big Yellow Taxi, and Marvin Gaye in Mercy, Mercy Me, The Ecology. There are an innumerable amount of books and written materials ranging from novels to news articles to scholarly journals that discuss and bring awareness to various issues that affect a green future such as climate change, natural resources, endangered species, pollution, ecosystems, and sustainable living practices. Documentarians and filmmakers use motion pictures to tell environmental stories. And photographers capture the beauty of our world and its natural habitats, which provide vivid visual representations of the importance of protecting and maintaining the planet for ourselves and for our future. These songs, books, articles, films, photographs, and more are all examples of copyright protected material. So as you can see, copyright and creative works have been at the forefront of environmental issues for many years, helping those who advocate for the earth to spread messages about sustainability, encouraging eco-friendly habits, and bringing awareness to environmental issues happening even in the most remote areas of the globe. These issues have the potential to affect us all. Through copyright, we're able to learn in exciting and interesting ways. Creators, in turn, are able to receive economic benefits, which helps them to continue to create. And others are inspired to make new works of their own and take actions that support or help resolve these issues. Our speakers today will provide real professional and personal insights into how copyright help them to inspire a green future. That brings me to our first speaker, Megan Parker. Megan is the Executive Director of the Society of Environmental Journalists, or SEJ. Before joining SEJ, Megan was a Senior Writer, Editor, and Partnerships Director for the Environmental Change and Security Program and the Global Sustainability and Resilience Program of the Wilson Center, a nonpartisan policy forum in Washington, D.C. She's also the founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning New Security Beat, a daily blog covering environment, health, and security. She was a supervising producer of the award-winning documentary trilogy, Healthy People, Healthy Environment, and she was the lead editor of A New Climate for Peace, an online platform and independent study commissioned by the G7 Foreign Ministers. So as you can see, Megan has a wealth of experience working in creative spaces that encourage a green future. Today, Megan will share how environmental journalists find and tell newsworthy stories about environmental issues and how collaboration can help when developing creative content. Now I will turn it over to Megan. As Jalen said, I am the Executive Director of the Society of Environmental Journalists, and we are North America's largest membership association for journalists covering energy and the environment. Um, and our mission is to increase and improve environmental journalism by supporting the people that produce it. 
um, why is environmental journalism important? Well, um, uh, something I've been saying a lot recently is that journalists are the first responders uh, for democracy and then environmental journalists, uh, particularly for our planet. They provide a number of services to the public um, uh, which are listed here. And as you can see, these represent sort of the, the core principles of journalism. It's accurate, um, it explains complex things uh, clearly so that people can understand, uh, reaches people broadly, mobilizes people locally, and perhaps most important, uh, journalists are key to our democratic process by holding the powerful accountable to their promises uh, to the public and to our citizens. And, and this is a, a key point for all journalists, and I'll explain why it's particularly important for environmental journalists. Um, but we have a challenge. The challenge is that environmental reporting has been shrinking uh, and that it will get worse. Um, the, since the 2008 recession really devastated the news industry's economic model, uh, which was already uh, under great threat from um, the changes uh, in our communication system wrought by online entities like Craigslist and Google and Facebook which undermined the advertising and subscriptions that have traditionally supported the news industry. After that recession, um, there were a number of layoffs and, and usually the environmental reporters were, were among the first to be laid off. It was not seen as a core beat uh, like sports or business or politics. Um, at that time, our membership plummeted uh, and uh, a number of our members uh, became freelancers uh, because they couldn't get staff jobs. Uh, in recent years, we've seen that recover. We were now back up to 1,500 members, which is um, a high point uh, for us. Uh, and we've seen a lot of um, newspapers really uh, invest in environmental reporting. The New York Times, for example, has a very robust um, climate team. But this latest crisis really threatens to be another devastating blow. Um, we've already seen newspapers, local newspapers close. Uh, reporters have been laid off, furloughed, hours cut. Freelancers have had their stories killed. It's had an immediate effect on our members. And so we expect that, unfortunately, we'll, can, we'll see another dip in membership, another uh, tough time for environmental journalism. So that's kind of bleak. Um, so how will we survive if it's so essential and so critical to, uh, to our planet and to our democracy? Well, I don't have all the answers, but I have a couple um, of ideas that, that come from our work um, at the society and from our members. Um, first of all, local coverage, particularly for the environment, is, is critical. Um, journalists report on what is happening on the ground and being able to cover uh, what's happening locally is critical to, um, to informing the audience. But we need to make those connections globally. Climate change is a global issue. It's a global problem that requires global solutions. So we need to be able to bridge that local to global gap. Another really important innovation uh, that has emerged in the last couple of years is the recognition the environment is not just this thing that sits over here, that it's connected to our health. And that's very clear right now, as you can see the stories about the origins of the, of the virus, potentially in wildlife trafficking or the way that um, people's environmental exposures affect their health outcomes. Um, it's also key to livelihoods uh, and, and it's connected to poverty and ultimately um, human rights. People have a right to clean air and clean water. Uh, so if you're covering the environment, you are covering all of these things, health, poverty, livelihoods, justice, human rights. And that is going to expand not just the topics that a reporter in this field can cover, but also the places in which you can publish and the people that you are going to reach. Um, critical, going to that point about uh, democracy, uh, journalists advocate and particularly um, organizations uh, like mine, membership organizations, are strong advocates for freedom of information. Um, every day we fight to ensure that the public maintains access to the data and information they need to understand their environment in which they live um, and to track the actions of the people charged with protecting that environment. 
but protecting freedom of information isn't free. Uh, it takes time, effort, lawyers, and money. Um, and so there is a cost involved. And uh, that's, a, I think, very relevant for what we're talking about here today is understanding that that information uh, isn't necessarily free. Um, but finally, and perhaps most importantly, collaboration. Collaboration to me is where we are, how we are going to survive, how we are going to get through uh, this crisis, the next crisis, and not only that, how we're going to thrive. And I wanted to share three uh, projects quickly that are collaborative projects that SEJ has been involved in uh, to some degree or another and in, in supporting. Uh, the first is a collaboration between the New York Times and the New Orleans Times Picayune called Our Drowning Coast. Uh, and this is a, a three-part in-depth series that really brings the best of both organizations um, together. Uh, Mark Schlifstein is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who's dedicated his entire career to covering the Gulf Coast at, uh, in, from New Orleans, um, was the instigator for this series. And it really, it digs, if you read it, it digs deep into the real lived experiences of the people uh, in the coastal regions and the threats and opportunities that they face. And then the New York Times brought in some amazing photography, uh, really innovative graphic, interactive graphics, which I encourage you to check out. There's a link at the bottom to a video of one of their interactive flyovers of, uh, of Jefferson Parish that shows what's happening with the coast and the sea level rise, as well as their audience. Um, they have a reach, a national, international reach even that the Times Picayune as a regional paper was not going to be able to to get to that audience. Um, so I think those kinds of collaborations uh, are fostered by a, a, a strong understanding of copyright as well, because both of these papers have, you know, uh, are for-profit entities that are trying to sell newspapers. Um, so they had to come to an agreement and understanding uh, about copyright in order to proceed with this collaboration that allowed them to share. The next, um, the second example I want to share is the Guardian US was running a series called This Land is Your Land about national parks. Um, and uh, as part of that series, they collaborated with big city daily newspapers in the Western US, like the Salt Lake City Tribune and the Denver Post and a number of others on different stories. And that's not easy to do for a number of reasons. One of which is just that each of those Papers is in a different location, has different audiences with different interests. So uh, while The Guardian is a national um, uh, or even global outlet, so the perspective needs to shift when you're publishing these, when you're co-publishing, you need to be able to speak to both audiences. So it's a tricky editorial um, approach, but they put the effort into it and it paid off. And this uh, photo here is from a series that specifically looks at um, the challenges of the overuse of our national parks and how um, uh, the increase in visitors and tourism uh, has had an impact on the landscapes and particularly the rise of insta, you know, insta tourism and, and selfies and how that has affected um, traffic patterns and use patterns uh, that have had negative impacts negative and positive impacts on the parks. And what's great about the collaboration is that they were able to then place this series in papers that were had some of these parks that were being affected in their, in their region, in their audience, so they could make that local to national to global connection. And the final collaboration I wanted to share is from High Country News, uh, which is a regional uh, news magazine um, focus on the American West that has long had an interest in covering conservation and land issues. Uh, and in the last few years, they have developed a very unique um, uh, area of specialty around indig covering indigenous affairs. They started um, a tribal affairs desk and they hired uh, Tristan Atone, who is the president of the Native American Journalists Association. Uh, to uh, to staff that desk, and really he built an incredible uh, portfolio of um, of stories uh, that really delved into uh, what's happening uh, on tribal lands uh, to uh, Native American communities and how it intersected with the environment and other issues um, in the region. 
uh, and this amazing um, photograph here is a, a, a part of a story about the impact of uranium mining on uh, tribal lands and reservations. Um, so I, that kind of ability to reach out, you know, beyond the sort of standard uh, set of beats, I think, is uh, also points to a new future um, where collaborations between newspapers, between nonprofits and news outlets, between um, membership organizations like SEJ and NAJA can really help foster um, and increase and improve environmental journalism. And the final note, just to, to show you the importance of, of copyright to all these projects, that when I went to uh, actually to copy this photo and I did get permission um, from High Country News to use it, this, this note popped up. Images are protected by copyright and copying them is not allowed. Please contact us. And you can see how, how important that is, especially to, to smaller uh, news outlets. How important it is that the work that they paid for, that their employees, um, need to be paid to do is protected by copyright and isn't just used for other purposes or, or even misused. Um, and uh, so I think that's uh, just a great note to end on how important um, intellectual property and today's event is uh, to environmental journalists and, and journalists and creators of all kinds. Um, thank you guys uh, very much. Thanks so much, Megan, for sharing that presentation and that information. And we will, I love to the um, audience, we will have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions for Megan, uh, please prepare them and hold them until the end. So next we have Sean Fitzgerald, who is a nature conservation and travel photographer. Sean strives to create images that are simple, graphic, surreal, and that in some way evoke a reaction, provoke an emotion, or tell a story. His photographic subjects are wildly varied, but he's repeatedly drawn to nature and wildlife and the impact of man on both. Sean's work has been published in a wide variety of publications. His fine art prints are found in private and corporate art collections across the country. He leads photo workshops for Ted Turner Reserves and has won numerous regional and national photo contests. His career has been featured in professional photographer magazines and CBS News recently named Sean one of the 10 emerging artists in the Dallas area. Today, Sean will discuss how he's inspired to capture and tell visual stories of nature and conservation, and he'll discuss the balance between harnessing copyright's economic incentives and bringing awareness to these issues. And now we'll hear from Sean. Yeah, thank you for for the invite. It's it's um, it's it's a great opportunity, and I really appreciate that. Um, my name is Sean Fitzgerald. I am a nature uh, conservation, environmental slash travel photographer. I'm a working photographer, just kind of an average Joe. So you're getting a perspective of somebody who is you know just trying to both make a living and contribute. Uh, I want to give a little background. Um, just so you kind of understand the perspective that I'm kind of coming from today, which is I, unlike some, uh, have taken kind of a backward route. I was an attorney, a litigator at a big firm for years, um, kind of burned out for various reasons and went into photography um, in part because of my love for nature and my want, my wanting to, um, to kind of work in that area in some way, shape or form. And then in the past few years, I have managed to somehow get back into legal issues through uh, advocacy efforts um, for photographers, especially in the area of copyright, um, working through groups like the North American Nature Photography Association and the American Society of Media Photographers. I've grown to understand much more than I ever did previously how important copyright is to us and how it works either actively or as, as a you know, background buttress to keep my ability to uh, make a living doing this real. So it, it's that foundation. And I did not, I can honestly say for many years, I did not understand that. And I think many photographers are in the same boat. You know, we have trouble engaging with the system sometimes and understanding how it helps us and how to use it. Um, 
and certainly that's my case as a freelance photographer. I wanted to give a, lot, a little bit sort of a peek into my mind in terms of how I try to do what I do and then give you some sense of the workflow uh, and real world issues I run into. So that's kind of where I'm going to focus. Uh, at, at the baseline, first question is why? Why do I do this? You know, um, and, and I think for many nature, environmental oriented photographers, the, the answer is very, very widely, quite widely. Uh, it's very personalized kind of decision and why you get into this. And I can only speak for myself, which in my case is um, I really want to tell stories about our world. I really, you know, that's what drives me. That's what gets me up in the morning and, and helps me work late at night is, is uh, the chance to do that. And my medium is visual. It's two-dimensional photos. And so with single photos or a series of photos, I hope I can help contribute to a story that helps somebody else understand, you know, what, what, what I'm trying to convey. Um, thematically, you know, for me, I'm always kind of driven and drawn to and searching out sort of these conflict points between man and nature. You know, I, I see a, a interconnected world in which our fates of mankind and, and the natural world, our mother earth are, inextricably intertwined to use a common legal term <laughs> we are in this mess together and if we you know and, and that's the story I, and i think that kind of helps ground me um my vision to some extent as i'm looking for those opportunities to tell that kind of a story um it's always a balance in my book between the mix of images that that give hope in that story versus what I, they barely describe as just despair is the state of affairs we're in and the path I think in many ways that we're on. Uh, each photographer, I think in this area figures out their mix and does it. And, and, and I'll give you some sense of how I try to try to make that decision. Um, at the forefront for me is I, I, I always love to find images that celebrate nature. I think it is critically important to show, um, the beauty of nature, all the all the various aspects of nature, and and, and to in many ways g allow me as one voice of many to give my unique perspective on the natural world. Uh, that means you know finding images that explain maybe the magic of uh, of a natural phenomenon or the majesty of uh, of nature in in conjunction with images that perhaps show the habitat in which those uh, that wildlife needs to survive, uh, showing the behavior and the dramas, the daily dramas that, that, that take place, uh, the rhythms and the flows of nature and uh, you know, the abstract uh, opportunities that, that, that pop out. You know, all those are part of what I think is critical to in the big category of celebrating nature. Um, you know, and, and quite frankly, you know, that's, I'm one of, the whole world loves to do this, and so that that game has changed in terms of how much of this I do nowadays. Um, but it's still really critical, uh, I think, to to keep that aspect in play, at least for me personally. Um, and at the end of the day, the goal is to connect my audience, um, which is, you know, people, to nature somehow. That's 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 a role that I can play to kind of help to get them connected because we have a tendency to protect what we love. And without that sort of link, um, the job of every conservationist I think is harder. So I can, in my ways, I can try to help, help do that. Um, and the flip side is that, you know, we, I, I don't think the opportunity at least has passed for me to simply tell celebratory images of nature. I feel compelled to, you know, find uh, images that also help, um, show the dark and the light, so to speak, show the impact of mankind on our world. And so, um, you know, in those situations where, um, you know, may get opportunities to, to photograph the beauty, you know, the flip side of that is that um, our impacts are felt in daily life and it's driven by, um, by us, by our needs, our wants, our cheap transportation, you know, transportation and food and, 
all these things that uh, we want have impacts, you know, they have consequences, and, and I try to show that as best I can. Um, images like, you know, big topics, you know, find like uh, safe, clean water in which we bathe or, um, or we go to for, you know, sacred purposes, like this is reflections of, uh, of people bathing in the Ganges. Um, you know, those sacred waters, the flip side is that we are literally, you know, loving our world to death. We are at capacity in many ways. We, uh, you know, across the board, um, you know, are, are stretching the ability of our earth to absorb our impact. And, and so, um, you know, there's always a yin to the yang, I think, for, for at least me as a nature photographer to try to look for those opportunities to tell those stories. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, the broad brush, it, you know, gets into the extremities of the weather, the impacts that we're causing on a more global scale, uh, and finding local sort of uh, images that can kind of represent that on a local basis, or and showing the impact on everyday people, um, you know, of the ex extreme weather events that uh, climate change is, is causing and is going to cause in greater uh, frequency going forward. Um, you know, and then finding images uh, or stories, broader stories, where you can go back and document with more depth, uh, such as a uh, series true to me, which is the monarch migration, which literally takes place right through. I live in Dallas, Texas, in the middle of America, uh, the Great Plains in the United States, and these monarchs fly straight over. And so I go down to Mexico, I go up to the Dakotas, I try to capture parts of that image. And that story is one of um, where it's not only one of nature's most majestic events, it's also one of its most endangered because all of the risks to our environment are converging. You know, we have habitat loss, uh, you know, in three, three countries, Mexico, United States, and Canada. We have uh, pesticide and herbicide use, which helps us get cheaper food. We have, um, you know, deforestation in Mexico, which is increasingly caused by even as um, you know, clearing these habitats for avocado farms, which, hey, I love guacamole, so I'm guilty. It's, it's such an interrelated kind of story. So when I can tell stories or find images that help, especially others tell the story, that's my job. I think that's what drives me. Um, so I come across situations like mass die-offs of monarchs. I photograph those uh, images that sort of others can use to kind of help illustrate broader, you know, the, the broader ecological impacts. Um, and that's what drives me on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the where, I think, is, is something um, where, yes, I, like any nature photographer, we can travel the world shooting you know, incredible things. But what I find, um, more and more I'm driven by the local stories, the local conservation stories, the impact of, um, you know, what, what I can tell in my own backyard effectively, such as, in this case, a whooping cranes that literally fly over my house as they go between Canada and where they stay on the Texas coast, to a uh, former Superfund site that I spent a lot of time in, uh, literally six miles from my house in Dallas, uh, formerly Polluted Pond, which is now um, in an area that's a bit of a wildlife oasis. Uh, these stories are everywhere, um, uh, and to give a sense of sort of the, the broad scale and the endangered aspect of it, this this is I live in a prairie region which um, we've paved. We've paved that parking lot um, or that paradise, if you want to riff on a Joni Mitchell song, I guess. And this is in a prairie, the Blackland Prairie, with it, which used to be extend 12 million acres uh, across Texas. Now there's 5,000 acres of it left. Much of it is in tiny pockets, in this case, a tiny little gap of it, native prairie up against a gas station, and the native prairie is for sale to be developed into whatever, another target or something. Um, but at a local level, it allows me to tell stories, to take pictures of people, local efforts, uh, local heroes, uh, uh, to get abstracts, images that are from my own backyard. And, and then ultimately, um, you know, tell stories that are personal to me and where I stand. And I find incredible meaning in that. 
And it's also been a way for me to help support myself because I've found that, that there are markets for that that aren't necessarily there, which gets us to sort of the, the, the business aspect of it, which is um, there's a constant sort of uh, push and pull between my wanting to do good versus my need to make a living, to make this a business that pays for itself and supports itself. And, and it's, it's not easy. It is, it is uh, not an easy proposition for many photographers. And it's certainly not one for nature and conservation photographers to figure out how to navigate this. Uh, at the root of the problem, or to some extent, is just the nature of this business, which is it's a very high volume. You know, it's easy to shoot uh, 100,000 images in a year, uh, or way more, depending on what you do. Um, and comparatively, the value is low for individual images for certain. And as the digital world has evolved, the, the, uh, the how do I phrase this, the effect of widespread, almost normalizing infringement as a way of uh, life, as a, as a right almost to be able to uh, have other people use your images, and in some cases other, you know, global companies uh, use those images and make money off those images and you get nothing, it just, it creates sort of a cycle of devaluing and devaluing where it makes it harder and harder to actually survive, um, which is where, to me, copyright comes in. It helps provide a baseline of value to my images and at least some way to protect against that continuing erosion of what my work is worth so that I can continue to put money that I make back into going out into the field to take more pictures, to tell more stories. There, it's, it's an interrelated process. Um, and to kind of wrap it up, just to give some sense of how, you know, how complicated sort of it is for me as an individual freelance photographer, I work on speculation where I put the bills, go out and shoot, uh, hoping I can sell the photos later into for either stock uh, or retail or commercial art so that I can, you know, make some money so I can support myself on that end. I'll do assignments on it, such as for magazines or some commercial businesses or environmental groups. Uh, and those images can then be used for that initial purpose and then back for stock and art. And then I, like many nature photographers, do some teaching and workshops where I can take some pictures, which then goes back into stock and art all of which in turn I put back out into you know, my own personal marketing, whether it's my website or social media or various other uh, agents and other stuff where I, where I place images. Um, and then I'll donate images as I can, kind of that balance for causes I believe in. And, and in, in terms of the big picture, we this is, creates this sort of, uh, I have images moving all over the place at any one time, dealing with, different kinds of, of you know, buyers and markets at any one time. And from a, a copyright perspective, that is really hard sometimes to handle. And I don't always do a particularly great job, but I like many like us, I try. Um, but it is not an easy proposition, especially um, for someone who's, you know, I may be gone quite a bit uh, and I don't really have the extra income to, to hire extra staff to handle that for me. Um, and, and just to kind of give a sense of sort of the boat that many photographers are in, we are now on a long-term, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates a 6% decline in our job outlook as photographers broadly. Um, and the coronavirus, as an example, has, has certainly amped up the pressure for many of us. And so, you know, being able to make sure that we can continue to do this is, hard and getting harder and uh, copyright is thus more and more important. So um, I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk and I'm happy to answer any questions here or uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, very, very interesting. And now we're going to move on to our final presenter. And that is Roshan Patel. Roshan is a media producer who's produced short films for a variety of environmental topics, ranging from lions in Western India to the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on deep sea artifacts and ecosystems. Roshan's films Pride 
and Red Wolf Revival have won awards at prestigious film festivals, including Best Short and Best Conservation Film at the International Wildlife Film Festival and Best Conservation Success Film at the New York Wild Film Festival. Roshan is currently a media producer at Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, where he creates films ranging in topics from coral conservation to wildlife poaching. Roshan will explain his creative process and how the Smithsonian is providing access to works for others to use and incorporate into their own creative works. Now I'll turn it over to Roshan. Um, so yeah, as um, was mentioned, um, I'm Roshan Patel. I'm the media producer for Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. Um, thanks again for having me. Um, this was really great, and um, I've loved the presentation so far. Um, Sean, I liked your hope and despair uh, sort of chart, and I would say that a lot of my stuff tends to be on the despair with an upward trajectory of hope, so trying to look at that transition. Um, so I'll talk about a few of those projects, and um, then from there, some of what we're um, doing at the Smithsonian to, um, yeah, make some of that a little bit more accessible um, to anyone that might be a creator. Um, so my background, um, as was mentioned, was is in film. Um, I started off as a freelance filmmaker, um, and then in 2017, um, I joined the Smithsonian, which was exciting for several reasons, um, one of which was that the National Zoo had not had a video um, person uh, on staff before. So um, there's a lot of things that we were going to start figuring out and um, get to decide how we wanted to move forward and start that in a process that was hopefully a little bit more helpful um, than rearranging our trajectory for a more digital and social platform world. Um, so that's been really fun. And um, the other part of it is that there's just so many wonderful stories within um, our own little unit. We, it's, so I, I am the filmmaker and photographer, um, mostly because our resources dictate that I am the entire team <laughs> um, uh, creating the content. And so, um, you know, the zoo has so many wonderful animals and um, opportunities, but we also are working in 30 countries around the world doing things like reintroducing um, species and studying uh, wildlife diseases and, and all sorts of things. Um, so, Smithsonian very generally, um, our founding mission is the increase and diffusion of knowledge, which as you all can imagine is very broad. Um, and so that has allowed us to do all sorts of um, exciting projects and um, you know, I, I, in our our digital presence has certainly fit into that, um, trying to figure out if people can't come visit the zoo or to museums downtown, how do we make the information that we have within our walls accessible to the general public um, so that you know, no matter where in the world you are, you have access to that information. Um, so I'll just jump right in into some of the projects that I've worked on in the few years that I've been in there, and then um, we'll go from there. But um, one of the first projects I worked on was um, in Myanmar. We had um, some scientists who are studying elephant trafficking. And so it's a very complicated story that is um, definitely on the not very optimistic side of things. But one of the really cool things has been seeing our scientists who have been spending their whole career on this um, work a lot more with people to try to figure out how to solve it. And so they've been doing things like collaring elephants and um, tracking their movements. And that's been able, that's been able to help um, everyone figure out how often these poaching events are happening, what it looks like, um, and be able to address it in much more tangible terms um, and challenge some of these trade routes that have existed over the years. And so that's been a really um, exciting project that we did a few films out of, um, short films, and those are online at the, at the National News website, but also we submitted them to film festivals and tried to get um, screening through those outlets as well. Um, another one that we did, just this is all just to give a sense of the types of environmental stories that we are working on. Um, we work a lot in Panama with amphibians and we have an, a herpetologist who 
um, is basically trying to reintroduce uh, endangered species of frogs back into the, into the environment. And many of them were wiped out from different diseases, um, including chytrid. And so basically he has been breeding a lot of these frogs and putting them back out into certain streams and rivers that they once were. And he's putting these little tracking devices here, as you can see in the image. And basically that allows them to monitor and collect data on where they're going, how long they're lasting, if some of the threats that they faced initially are um, still threats. And that'll help us figure out, you know, are there certain genes in certain frogs that are more resistant to some of these diseases? So again, starting from a point of there's not a very optimistic starting point. A lot of these frogs have been wiped out, but some of these scientists are doing really amazing things to try to figure out how to get them back. Um, so, you know, we again did a little short film about that in 2017. Um, one of the ones that I just finished up was on corals in Curacao. So we um, were working with this endangered species of corals called an elkhorn coral. Um, and they're really amazing. They do so much for the environment um, in terms of just their structure is so unique. So they provide different types of homes for fish that other groups of corals don't provide. And they're float near the surface, so they break waves, they fragment and do all sorts of really neat things to the reef. Um, but they have basically gone through so many different events through disease and storms that some of the populations are um, basically effectively the same. So there's not a lot of uh, crossbreeding between coral populations. So if you don't know, corals are animals, um, even though they don't necessarily look like it, but they, um, you know, they need sexual interaction basically. And that has not happened because a lot of these diseases. So we have a scientist who has been working on taking some of these coral populations from one place, breeding them with another in a lab and then planting them, which has never been done before. Um, and that has gone really well. And so we're starting to look at things of how do we support populations of corals that exist um, around the world using this technique and figure out, can we make sure that there is a better chance of fighting off disease or lasting past the bleaching event? So um, some of these very certain threats um, are, are able to be met with some, some fighting chance. And the last one I'll sort of talk about is, um, perhaps the most relevant to now is we did a story um, also in Myanmar with some of our uh, wildlife veterinarians, and they basically are looking at um, how to prevent pandemics. And so they have been looking for years in some of these caves, um, looking at bat populations and primate populations, and um, basically just trying to identify new viruses. Um, they'll study livestock and uh, people as well to, to basically take swabs and see what viruses are transmitting between the three um, and see if those are causing harm, because if they are, those are things that are um, very serious concern um, for the planet. And so um, the hope is basically to try to identify as many of these viruses as possible so we can start to see, you know, where are they coming from? How do you prevent those interactions? So if it's all coming from a certain population of bats in one cave, how do you have better livestock practices that don't rely on, on the bat guano for fertilizer the same way that you might somewhere else. Um, so obviously there's a lot of work to be done on this, but um, it was a little window into what that world looks like and um, is really important work. Um, and I hope that at least out of some of this, we start to make some of those environmental connections between what's happening in the world and uh, what we can do to better understand it and hopefully prevent it in the future. So we can not only save people, but also the species that um, you know, to no fault of their own are just trying to live their life and um, we keep impacting them um, and interacting with them in all sorts of ways. Um, this one is from our current research in Montana, um, the American Prairie Reserve, so slightly more local. Um, but yeah, it's um, a place where we're doing a lot of bison research and trying to reintroduce new species like swift foxes in the coming years. Um, so these are all stories that we're going out and filming and, and taking some photos. Um, I would love to show you all videos, but um, due to the uh, conference, basically, it would 
be very laggy. And so I'm just using stills for this, but there are videos on our website um, from all of these places and all of these stories. So in the last few months, you may have seen this and where this sort of comes to this conversation is that Smithsonian has um, put 2.8 million objects under the Creative Commons Zero uh, license. And so basically what that means is that any of those materials can be used for any, any purpose without permission from Smithsonian. Um, so this kind of fits into that initial founding mission um, of infusion and um, spread of knowledge. And so uh, that includes still images, 3D images, data from um, different research projects, and we're hoping to continue to expand that um, to include things like video. Um, so that will be coming later this year. Um, and so um, that's something that I'm really excited about because under a brand like Smithsonian, we're able to deliver it widely, but also, you know, be a resource for other storytellers um, that may want to use some of this content. So if you go even now, even though video is not yet up there, a lot of our photos from the zoo are. Um, so in fact, actually all the images that I've used in this presentation are currently available under the Creative Commons Zero uh, license. So people can download high resolution images and uh, use them. So if you go to si.edu slash open access, um, you can search. And so this is what that interface looks like. And you can kind of see that there's a lot of keywords um, and where the photos were taken um, that we try to include in the metadata. So it's as searchable as possible. Um, so that includes images from natural history, from the zoo, from uh, all the Smithsonian units. Um, so that launched in February. We're hoping to get to at least 3 million this year. And like I said, uh, since this, the National Zoo has a living collection, unlike many of the other units, we are um, heavily invested in trying to get video uh, to be a part of this. So we've been filming everything in 4K. Um, since 2017, and so we are um, trying to basically create these databases of, you know, high resolution uh, video of all of our species that are at the zoo, but then also some of our field sites. So we'll put up, you know, 30 seconds of uh, footage of bison or of sage grouse in Montana or of a forest in Myanmar or elkhorn coral um, that people can use um, as soon as they go up. So that's something that I'm very excited about. Um, I think it will be um, a resource that I haven't seen in film very often where there's um, the ability to have a database of high resolution uh, content. So that's something that I'm very excited about. And I think this is actually gonna have an environmental impact in several different ways. Um, two of which are that First and foremost, it'll help creators tell stories um, in a way that um, you know may may have been a little bit more difficult before. So if you're a blogger or a documentary filmmaker and you just need footage of an arapaima like you see on the screen or of giant pandas, then you can go to our site, pull it, and use it immediately. Um, and so I think that's going to be helpful for a lot of our storytelling um, and. And I hope that that becomes um, a large resource for um, those who are trying to create content. But I think the other part of it is um, the environmental impact of doing this work. Um, you know, there are so many times where you can go anywhere in the world and, fi and find teams of people filming the exact same wolf that's running around um, in a park. And though that footage certainly different has different style elements and everything like that, um, hopefully it'll also allow people to create content without needing to go to that place. So that becomes really helpful for emerging filmmakers or people on independent budgets or people who are trying to have a net zero film where they don't um, go anywhere to create a story about something that they're hoping to tell a story about. Um, so that's kind of it for me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but like I said, I think you know our goal is really to try to put more tools in the hands of creators um, and so that we aren't holding the keys to the kingdom, um, so to speak, with a lot of this footage. Um, anyone that creates knows how much stuff doesn't ever make it out. And so, um, you know, hopefully that th this umbrella of footage will be um, a good resource for anyone interested.
Well, thanks again and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Roshan, for that presentation. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and for sharing in um, your expertise and insight. And I'd also like to thank our audience members who have um, stuck around with us. We are a few minutes over, but we would like to offer an opportunity for questions for those who may be available to, to stay a little bit longer um, if you'd like to ask some questions. We'll take about five minutes for questions. And I see that we actually already have a few, so I will start um, with the first one here. So our first question is regarding the use of AI. Um, for those who may not be familiar, AI is artificial intelligence. And the question is, um, and I believe this is to all of the panelists, what are your thoughts regarding the use of artificial intelligence in um, creating original works? And how do you see that perhaps impacting your work? And how do you see that impacting copyright, if you will? And maybe we can start with, um, I guess we can go in the order that we had the presentation. So let's start with Megan, if you have, um, if you'd like to. Say yeah, like I have a thank you. It's a really interesting question. Um, for writers, I think AI is still pretty uh, far hard, hard to replace writing uh, with AI at this point. There's English is a complicated language, and um, it's very hard for uh, the robots to uh, to make it uh, flow. Um, there is, however, a lot of really interesting journalism. Um, that's being done with uh, data and big data and some, uh, you know, AI com um, tools uh, used to analyze that data. Um, uh, and I don't know to what degree those tools are, um, have play, you know, have any role or say in copyright. I would think that it's a lot like any other software. Uh, at that point that they wouldn't necessarily have a role. Oftentimes, though, I do see data journalists citing the tools that they use um, and, you know, as well as making um, the data sets, you know, available to others. So, uh, so yeah, interesting question. I think a lot, a lot to come uh, as the technology um, evolves. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for photography, you know, certainly AI is creeping its way into the gear we use. Uh, I mean, the fact that, you know, if you started in film days and you know what it took to sometimes even just try to balance the light in the scene versus what cameras, even a cell phone camera, your iPhone can do today using artificial intelligence is, is insane. It's just mind boggling to us, any of us who started in the analog world. Um, and it's certainly going to, you know, keep proceeding. I think at the end of the day, though, I think what most photographers feel is that the the camera is sort of irrelevant. It's it's you try, it's your vision, it's your eyes, it's what you see. Is that's and that's what I don't think machines can ever really totally replace for on our end of things. Um, hopefully, the the AI supplementing the ability to capture our vision would not raise, I don't think that would raise any particular copyright issues. It would still be created by us at the moment of creation, but um, but it's certainly coming and it's gonna raise a whole host of issues. On the, on the use end of things, I do think that AI creates issues with truth because, you know, it's important that the viewer understands the truth of how the image was captured. And so, you know, from a, a user perspective, captioning those kinds of images that perhaps are created using AI. I mean, now you can, in some of these animated movies, gosh, I can't tell that it was, you know, not, well, who's the Lion King one or whatever, you know, that it's created in a, in a computer. I mean, and, and, um, and we'll have to figure out uh, kind of industry-wide standards for making sure if those kinds of pictures are, are placed into medium, how people can understand that what's the difference between a, naturally captured uh, image versus one that's been created. I think we'll have to uh, 
um, you know, take care to you know, keep truth in what we represent. So that's that's kind of all I see. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know if I have much more to add on that, but I would say that, you know, I think this is a society-wide question of what do we value, um, with, you know, on some level what copyright is about, too, about ownership and creativity. And so, um, and so I think, you know, if we want to see more AI and decide that that is something that um, we want to value in that way, we'll have to sort of cross that bridge, but I personally have not. Um, had to yet. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for um, your responses to that. Um, and so we have another question. This question is actually specifically for Sean. And it asks um, so actually, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation. You talked a little bit about um, the coronavirus. Um, and how that's being captured. But this question, I guess, specifically asks, have you been able to capture any wildlife? Um, has there been an increase in, in, in increase in wildlife presence in urban areas? And if so, have you been able to capture that, or have you found a theme or story in that? Uh, I have not personally yet. I live in uh, inner, inner, inner Dallas and, uh, and a lot of wildlife around here, but I know that I've certainly followed stories that other photographers have been capturing in, in suburban areas, especially where wildlife that have been pushed and have been trying to survive on the edges of, of humanity are, are creeping their way in. And I think that that's going to be one of the fascinating stories. Personally, no, but it's, that's, that's part of the, you know, my, the whole sort of conflict between man and nature and, and when our presence is removed, um, you know, there's some extraordinary stories playing out. Uh, I just saw the other day um, indications of whales and dolphins and other um, uh, species have been seen in, in various areas they haven't been seen for a while, and largely because just our input, our in, um, our presence, the noise we create from all our shipping and other things is not there. And that's uh, you know, that's that's a fascinating subject to me. So I, I I hope that those photographers who are able to capture those images in those areas are able to do that. So, but it's yeah, it's a fascinating fascinating topic. Yeah, um, I know that was a question for Sean, but do any of the other panelists have anything that they might want to add to capturing, I guess, um, stories related to? the coronavirus um, epidemic or pandemic virus that we're all experiencing now. Yeah, our members um, have been, I've seen a couple of stories they've done about that, you know, issue about the um, increase in um, in wildlife due to the decrease in, mostly the decrease in traffic. Um, but yeah, there's an, an enormous number of environmental angles um, to uh, this um, crisis. We produced a tip sheet for our members on, on finding them and there it's actually a, a, a quite quite a lot um, and I think you know one of the ones that has been the most interesting to me has been looking at the impact on emissions of the slowdown in transportation and in economic activity um, and it's kind of been a mixed bag you see a lot of very dramatic photographs about you know, uh, different um, air, like visible differences in air quality, but in terms of actual emissions, it, 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 the decline isn't as dramatic as you might think. So there's a, there's a lot we're still going to learn about, well, maybe it only takes a small decline to produce better air quality, or maybe it's the kinds of emissions or the density or location. Um, and what does that mean in the big picture for for uh, efforts to mitigate climate change. Uh, there's a lot we're going to learn um, from this. Um, and I would say that from our side, we've definitely seen a lot more interest in, um, you know, some of our stories dealing with global health. And, and I think that that's something that has been interesting and makes sense. Um, I think as this goes on, we start to make a lot more connections um, between all the, you know, millions of ways that environment impacts us. Um, not just in terms from not doing things, but also how we prevent something like this from happening again. Um, and so that's been really interesting. I've, I've seen so many 
people spend their entire careers on trying to get wildlife markets to be as big of a topic as it is. And so, you know, unfortunately, it's after something has happened, but I hope that there's some sustained interest in, in figuring out what we do to, um, you know, address some of these, these problems um, that are very directly connected to environment and wildlife. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we are at our time. I'd like to thank again all of our panelists for joining us today and thank the audience members who were able to stick around. Thank you for um, staying with us on the in the event. And I'd also like to let everyone know that this um, webinar for this event will be made available on the Copyright Office's YouTube page. So if you missed any of it, you can um, check it out there. And I'd also like to encourage everyone to um, follow the Copyright Office on Twitter and also subscribe to our various newsletters and blogs. You can do that by going to copyright.gov slash subscribe. And that wraps up our event for today. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.